I'm going to ask you permission to for me to record and this one and this and hopefully hopefully folks i'm sorry i've had some tech issues this morning but you're listening to the louis b free radio show brain food from the heartland i am thrilled to have dr gabby wild as doctor. my guest doc good morning good morning thank you for having me this morning thank you for suffering my madness there just for a little bit very gracious i i appreciate that i am delighted with your new book but first if you don't mind i'd like to talk a little bit about your background tell us about yourself and your journey i think is how young people say it today yes yes so i'm a wildlife veterinarian i've loved animals since i could remember and i went to cornell for undergrad and graduate school and i became a wildlife veterinarian and here we are now. I have a foundation for endangered animals, That's and awesome. I travel the world to provide complementary veterinary medicine for a lot of these threatened animals. I also work with the WCS, a Wildlife Conservation Society. A lot of people know them as the Bronx Zoo, but we're a little bit more than that. I do small animal surgery as well in New York. And um, that's that's the gist of it. But the, the way in which I got to National Geographic was because of all the wildlife work I do internationally. And I do acupuncture on elephants and do a lot of wow. unique, wacky things. So my work in, in through the foundation, people like you just donate to support all that we do. And when we have the funds and we're able to, when organizations internationally, whether it's an NGO, a national park, a rescue, say, hey, we have X animal or X herd or X issue that we really need addressed. When that occurs, then we're able to move forward and go ahead and, and get out in the field and, and help that animal or those, those animals out or the situation of collaring or whatever it might be. That's beautiful. And again, folks, if you are able to donate, please do. It's gabbywild.org, gabbywild.org. And of course, I've got those links up, you folks, you know where at all the WFMJ, Louis Free Show, et cetera, et cetera. So check out, the, you'll be fascinated by Dr. Gabby Wild's work. Go to the website and check it out. If you don't want, you've always loved animals. I've always loved animals, but I didn't become a veterinarian. Maybe sadly, maybe, maybe that would have been a better path. But tell me a little bit more about what was the tipping point, if you will, to say, you know what, I'm going to do this. When I was four, it was official. I saw when the- were, I'm sorry, when you were four years old? Yeah, yeah. I declared when I was four, I was going to become a veterinarian. I did not appreciate Mufasa dying. And I thought I would have fixed it. Now, a little bit of time and understanding, I would not have fixed that fall. That was a pretty bad one. But regardless, it was inspirational nonetheless. That's incredible. I mean, that's that's beautifully stated, by the way. When you were four, that just blows me away. When I talk with people that made a decision when they were really young, I'm just like, I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to do with when I grow up with my life. But the, the acupuncture, you are certified in acupuncture also. Yes. I read that on your bio. Yeah, yeah. I'm the first elephant acupuncturist in the past 3,000 years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, I know we've got limited time. First in 3,000 years. I've got to make a note of that. I, I have so many questions I'd love to ask you, ask you about the acupuncture and some of the animals that you've treated, but I want to get into your new book, which by the way, folks, as you know, I've been talking about this book. I absolutely love it. And for listeners, Dr. Wild is holding it up and I have, will have pictures posted of it also. How to Speak Animal. A guide to learning how animals communicate. Tell me the background of the book, if you. This is one of your books. Yeah, last year we released Wild Vet Adventures by Dr. Gabby Wild, and then this one is intended to give more of a in-depth discussion about how animals communicate. So we divided it into four sections: on on the on the land in the water, in the air, and by our side. So we can kind of understand the different types of communication divided by what they're probably gonna be more prevalent doing. And then we have different six, like over 60 animal profiles in here, where we talk about how these different animals do communicate based off of what we've been able to study. So some ways we communicate right now, you see both 
auditory, you hear both auditory and you see both visual. So that's how a lot of humans do most of our communicating. But we also have tactile. So I might give you a hug if you were here. Mm -hmm. um, there's that. And then they're also chemical. So we smell things. That's a really big form of communication as well. And a smell might not just be the only chemical, but it might be pheromone chemicals that we are, are using. And then electromagnetic. So that's also kind of, if you will, in a way, a tactile way. And the, the best example of electromagnetic are sharks. We've really been into sharks because shark week just passed by. And sharks, you may not want to communicate with them, but when you go in the water, you are. Because right. they're able to read your magnetic pulses. And by doing that, by being able to read your magnetic pulse, they're able to be like, oh, over there. That one. I'm going um, for that one. <laughs> so there are different ways in which we communicate whether we want to or not. That's it, I, again, I, I do want to say this. The book is, and correct me if I say this, if you don't like the way it says, it's targeted for young people. It is a, a kid's, it's targeted for young people, correct? Yes, it's targeted for ages eight to 12, but I assure you, you're going to you never knew before. I I want to say that I love this and I find this book absolutely fascinating. And I'm an old, old man. So I my suggest all ages. Everybody's going to learn something. And I will also add everybody's going to be fascinated yes. by this book. Book available everywhere and everywhere online, of course, folks. It's a Nat Geo, it's a National Geographic Kids book. But again, I highly recommend it. Oh, great idea would be to read it together with your child. It's good for reading, reading out loud, bonding with your kid. I think that's that's a great idea. Or if you don't have kids around, read it. You will love it. I love, I love <laughs> it. Go ahead. Literally take it to dinner and be like, by the way, I'm just going to flip to a page. It doesn't matter. It's not like it's a storybook. Okay. Today, you know what? At dinner, guys were, if you were eating crab, you're going to feel badly about eating crab because I turned to the crab page and you're going to learn about crabs. When coconut crabs leave their burrows, they'll wave their claws in the air. This lets other crabs know I'm coming. Stay back. Or leave me alone. It turns out that these crabs are well crabby. They don't like company. So That's beautiful. Go ahead. Just open up a page and read it to your friends and, and just learn something random. If you keep reading that page, you'll learn that crabs can actually let go of their little claw if they need to. So you'll, you'll go into it and learn more ways in which they communi communicate. So you and don't I'm, have to I'm going to say this. Yeah, anywhere. Just open open a page. I agree with you. I, I'm going to say, and this is not obviously not Dr. Wild, and then stop eating crabs. That's just my, you don't mind that I say that I don't mind that's you know what everyone has their, their personal things I personally don't eat crabs but I'm not going to push my thing on others no. the only thing I'll push on others is just be nice to them do yeah. it if you're yeah. going to do it you know and if you're yeah and read the book and, and you'll learn more read about the them yeah. and then you might not want to eat a crab but hopefully I, I'm saying hopefully <laughs> uh, rabbits I've got to ask you about rabbits, you may see in the studio, I've got tons of rabbit ears. I've had many, many rescue um, rescue buns. Do you mind focusing on rabbits just for a minute? I so we have a little I section love. on rabbits, but of course, so rabbits obviously are prey animals. So you know that by the way, their, their eyes are on the side of their head. And it's, um, it's essential when we're dealing with rabbits to understand that, that even to people, they might be so, so cute. And they may have evolved with, humans in some of in, in some <laughs> excuse me in some of the breeds but we always have to be really respectful that they're petrified of us so they are going to want to jump away from us they're going to want to you know stay away the main way in which rabbits communicate are auditory obviously they communicate with visual cues um you know you, you know the, the the typical rabbit thump with the auditory the yeah, typical rabbit moves, how they they move they, they move their, their eyes, their ears, the nose, the twitching. Um, and um, also, and they also lift their ears in certain ways, but that's also to help them not only listen, but also to have these visual cues. But they also use um, uh, chemosensory, so smelling. You notice rabbits do this. That they actually are trying to sense what's going on in the environment. And um, they they actually really vocalize a lot. I'm, I'm sure you've experienced that rabbits will even give out little squeaks when they're a little bit afraid. And so we have to be taking up on those cues. 
So yeah, and the, they burrow and how you hold them to make sure that they feel really comfortable is a, another form of communication. And it takes, it, it can take a while if, if with a, you know, with a, a rescue. And I urge people to rescue animals, uh, adopt, don't shop, I think is what it says. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Plenty of ways to do it. And of course, the chemoreceptors and their scent glands and how they communicate and know which one is which and how, how they mate by understanding their scent glands. You know, it's, there you go with animal with with rabbits. And I love that. And uh, you know, ch again, I shouldn't focus on rabbits. I'll close with it. When chinning, you wrote about chinning, and anybody that's had a rabbit knows how they chin and and mark things. Right. And I'm so delighted. There. So delighted when when a rabbit chin me. It's like, oh yeah, I'm part of. I'm part I like of you. Group. Yeah. And I'm mocking you. Another thing they're doing, they're mocking you, and they're letting you know that we're staying together. So yeah. yeah. I love that. I love that. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get tear. Tear. I'm gonna start tearing up. Again, the name of the book available everywhere and everywhere online is "How to Speak Animal," and I love it for listeners. You can't see it, but uh, Dr. Wild holds up the book. It's great. A guide to learning how animals communicate. Once again, and always available everywhere and everywhere online. It's a National Geographic book. I mean, you even talk about. I know you got to split in a couple of minutes, but you even talk about honeybees and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't want to sound too wacky. My audience knows sometimes I get the feeling they're communicating, I don't know, with me. Maybe that sounds really weird. You know? At certain down times, when I'm feeling, a, a bee comes by as if to, now I'm going to sound really whacked, but as if to say, put your head up. It's going to be okay. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. I probably shouldn't say that on air. Every time. You can certainly say it, you know. Just because we don't know it yet doesn't mean it doesn't potentially exist. Really, who knows? We, we, we really don't yet. Um, we, we do know that they communicate really well with each other. In fact, they use trigonometry to know where the best pollen is or where a predator is or, or things of that nature, that they actually have different dances. The big famous one is the waggle dance, but there's the, the round dance. And so it's, it's actually quite amazing to see the way in which they communicate with one another, whether they communicate with us yet, actually, yes, they do. They sting us. They say you're a, you're a, you're a pest, and I'm going to sting you. And when they do that, they actually release pheromones so that the that her sisters can come and know that she's in distress. And th those pheromones stay on you. So if you get stung, you should wash yourself because the other bees are actually cued in to come find you. Wow. And also, Dr. Gabby Wild, I love that you wrote about them being pollinators, something I talk about a lot. And no bees, no us. So please do what you can, plant milkweed or whatever. Don't kill them unless, I don't know, I hate to say unless you have to. Um, if it's you or them, whatever, or your kids are there. But I love that you include those those things like that in the book, How to Speak Animal. I love talking with you. I hope I can do the gig with you again. And I, I, I it's too brief for me. There's so much. I've got. If you saw my list of questions, you'd you'd freak out. And say, oh, I can't do all of those. But you're amazing, and you're so. I love your personality and your openness, Doctor Wild. But go to the website, folks. Please go to the website. GabbyWild.org, GabbyWild.org. Donate if you can, but you'll get a real education. Buy the book, gift the book. Most important, read the book, How to Speak Animal. Dr. Wild, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Stay on. Pleasure. She's amazing, folks. Again, uh, the book, I have to say once again, for 